All right, I would like to start this video with a little bit of an exercise. So if you don't mind playing along, here's what I'd like you to do. Okay, I want you to imagine a dog, just any dog. When I say the word dog, what image comes to mind? And then I want you to go into the comments and in as much detail as possible, describe what you just saw in your mind's eye. Feel free to pause the video right now. Just go down there. I say, dog, what do you see? Describe it in as much detail as possible. Go ahead. All right, so some of you will have described a very specific dog, a specific breed, a specific color, maybe a specific color pattern, length of hair, um, size, maybe it's even doing something, maybe it's running or panting. A certain percentage of comments will describe it as if you're looking at an actual picture or a video. For others, the description might just be of a vague dog, you know, no specifics really, but still a dog. And of course, most of those comments will describe your mom. But if recent studies are an indicator, there's probably about three to 5% of you that weren't able to visualize anything at all. Maybe didn't even understand the question. Because as it turns out, there are some people who just don't have a mind's eye. This inability to visualize in your mind's eye is a condition called aphantasia. It's also known as image-free thinking. Those who have aphantasia have an inability to create images in their heads of people, places, and objects. On the complete opposite side of that is a condition called hyperphantasia, which is experienced by 10 to 15% of people. These are people who have extremely vivid experiences of visualizations in their brains. Now to be clear, it's not just one thing or the other. It's not just people can do it and can't do it. It's, it's a spectrum. According to Dr. Adam Zeman of the University of Exeter in Britain, quote, this is not a disorder as far as I can see. It's an intriguing variation in human experience. And Dr. Zeman should know because he's the person who coined the term aphantasia. Fantasia being a Latin word for fantasy or, or imagination, so aphantasia is the lack of that. And he coined this phrase in 2015 after meeting a patient that he named MX who had lost his ability to visualize in his brain following a surgery. And yeah, after telling that story to the media, people just started coming out of the woodwork saying, yeah, I, I'm that way too. I've never been able to visualize either. And this is when things got interesting because it's not that rare. This is actually a fairly common thing, but people didn't really know that it was an experience that people had because we don't really talk about that. We just assume that everybody visualizes and thinks in the same way that we do. Like it kind of took somebody losing it for us to understand that it was something that you could not have. Although it wasn't totally out of the blue. A British psychologist named Francis Galton actually did some, some experiments around this back in 1880. Yeah, he conducted a study of 100 people where he asked them to describe their breakfast table and he found that 12 out of that 100 people either had very dim visuals of their breakfast table or no visuals at all. But this research was practically ignored for about 100 years until Dr. Zeman came up with MX's story. Now, even though the term aphantasia technically means without imagination, that's not really what's going on here. People with aphantasia can still have an imagination and experience the world fully just like everybody else. They just don't do it using a mind's eye like the rest of us do. In fact, they're probably really good at remembering facts but then struggle with things like uh, facial recognition and stuff like that. Like for example, when somebody with aphantasia was asked to describe his fiance uh, to a BBC interviewer back in 2015, he said that he could remember that she had her hair up you know, in a bun and that it was brown. He remembered the specific things like that but he couldn't really describe her face. He said, quote, but I'm not describing an image that I'm looking at. I'm remembering features about her. That's the strangest thing. In other words, people with aphantasia can recall images that they've seen, but it's, it's memory, it's not imagination. And also it's not just visual images. Something that kind of spread around on social media recently was this idea that some people speak with an inner monologue in their brains and some people don't. And that's a kind of aphantasia. And for what it's worth, if you're wondering, I personally don't have a monologue. I have a dialogue with multiple characters. I, I basically have a Monty Python sketch going on in my head at all times. And I personally can't imagine how somebody could function without an inner monologue of some kind, but the fact that people do that is just fascinating to me. And actually my writer Jason, when he was researching this, he found out that somebody in his improv troupe has aphantasia. And the way he described it was that he said that he, he doesn't really have an inner monologue, he just sort of has a string of words, and it becomes monologue if he can like imagine it in an actor's voice. Like he can kind of make his thoughts have a narrator. And as for images, he says that he, he doesn't necessarily see an image, but he remembers all the specific details of it. He said it's almost more like looking at a spreadsheet of data points as opposed to an image. It's almost like the, the image link is broken to use a computer term. And this is a common thing that I ran across while researching this. People with aphantasia, they, they can remember all the details, but they can't really put it together into a visual image. 
Now to switch to the other side of the spectrum for a second, people with hyperphantasia have experiences in their brains that are so real that they can sometimes have trouble differentiating between what's imagination and what's reality. In fact, for some people, the visualization in their head is actually more real and affecting than looking at an image itself. The artist Claire Dudenay described this in an interview with Science Focus in 2019, saying, quote, When people describe some terrible accident, I visualize it so strongly that I feel it's happening to me. She added, I can watch gruesome things on TV and be fine, but a passage in a book can bring to mind such vivid images that I faint. Like, honestly, I might be closer to that than to aphantasia, because, like, sometimes I'll be daydreaming and and say I might, in the daydream, be reaching for something, then I'll, like, go like this and, you know, knock something off my desk. It happened a lot when I was in school, actually. I got stared at a lot. But like Dr. Zeman said uh, earlier in the video, this is not a cognitive ailment by any stretch. It's just a different way of experiencing the world. In fact, there may be pros and cons to each end of the spectrum. In fact, some of the positive traits for aphantasia include high abstract reasoning, increased concentration skills, and being more present in the moment. Some disadvantages include unable to dream in pictures, inability to imagine the faces of loved ones who have passed away, or being lost when somebody describes something when you haven't seen or experienced. For hyperphantasia, the pros may include being able to vividly see everything in your head, the ability to plan things in more detail, and resuming dreams after you wake up. But some of the challenges may include seeing everything vividly in your head, reliving situations over and over in your head, and the inability to keep focus. In fact, some have argued that people with aphantasia might be able to handle traumatic experiences better than other people because they don't relive it as vividly in their mind's eye as other people do. Whereas somebody with hyperphantasia might be more prone to conditions like PTSD because every time they, they remember a traumatic experience, it's kind of like they're reliving it all over again. So if you have aphantasia, you might find that you have a bit of a leg up in mathematical or scientific professions. And that might beg the question, like, is there a test you can take to see what your natural abilities might be with a condition like that? Turns out, yes, there are several tests to determine where you lie on the spectrum. British psychologist David Marks developed the Vividness of Visual Imagery Questionnaire, or VVIQ, in 1973. Researchers refer to it most often when they study imagery extremes like aphantasia and hyperphantasia. And the test includes four scenarios in which you're asked to rank how vividly you can see them in your mind. The scenarios include imagining a loved one's face, a favorite store, or a pretty landscape. The one to five ratings go from no image at all to perfectly realistic. Another evaluation is the Spontaneous Use of Imagery Scale, or SUIS, which measures general occurrences of imagery in daily life. It consists of 12 scenarios and uses a 5-point rating scale. A Dutch version uses 9 scenarios. And SUIS doesn't measure the auditory part that I mentioned earlier, the inner monologue thing, it only focuses on visual imagery. And SUIS is concerned with the frequency and likelihood of mental imagery composed of the VVIQ that focuses on the vividness and quality of mental images. There's also the Object Spatial Imagery Questionnaire, or OSIQ. This was created to evaluate individual differences in visual imagery experiences and preferences. And this has two scales. One is object imagery, which evaluates preferences for processing and representing colorful high-res and pictorial images of specific objects. And spatial imagery, which evaluates preferences for processing and representing relations among objects, spatial transformations, and schematic images. Another way to measure visual imagery is binocular rivalry. This process investigates the neural mechanisms of perceptual awareness. Okay, so visual perception alternates between our eyes during binocular rivalry when we're presented with two different fields of view. The back and forth of perception relies on the strength of inhibitory interactions between neuronal groups in the visual cortex. Studies using binocular rivalry priming have shown that aphantasia is more due to a lack of sensory imagery and not a lack of metacognition. Okay, those were a lot of big words and that kind of broke me, but uh, I'll put some links to all these different tests down in the description so you can go check it out for yourself and see where you lie. Well, hold on a second, if we experience visuals in our mind's eye differently, then how does this process affect how we actually see things visually? Like, if we, if we process images in our brain and our brains process images differently, then are we actually seeing different things? Like, how exactly does our brain process visual imagery? Well, here's a brief rundown. The optic nerve travels to two different places, the thalamus and the superior colicolis, which helps determine where our eyes and head move. The visual input then travels to the visual cortex from the thalamus. And the visual cortex is located at the back of our brains. It's where the, the building blocks of vision are combined to produce perception. And researchers believe that visual processing occurs through two information streams. The where pathway, which deals with object movement and location, and the what pathway, which recognizes and identifies objects. But the visual cortex can be divided into several distinct subregions, with simple visual features located in the bottom areas and more complex features in the higher areas. The primary visual cortex is at the bottom, and it's sensitive to basic visual signals like object orientation and direction. 
The next area up responds to contours, textures, and if something's in the background or the foreground. After this area, the pathways carrying what and where information split up into specific brain areas. For example, the inferior temporal cortex that represents complete objects is located at the top of the what hierarchy. And there's even a part of this cortex called the fusiform face area that specifically responds to faces. But this is a bottom-up approach to processing visual information, and that's a very slow way of doing it. So the brain also relies on top-down approaches to process visuals. This is where the imagination and the mind's eye stuff comes in. Since a lot of that information gets lost by the time it gets to the brain, our brain uses memories to extrapolate and, and apply experiences to what you're seeing in the moment. And these top-down mechanisms affect things like attention, object expectation, scene segmentation, and working memory. So yeah, the entire visual pathway uh, except for the light actually connecting with the retina, is affected by these top-down mechanisms. So knowing this, how do we create images in our heads without some kind of visual input? Like, like how does our imagination actually work? A study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2013 can help answer this. The study's researchers analyzed multiple patterns of fMRI data and discovered that it wasn't just the visual cortex alone that contributed to imagination. There are actually 12 regions of interest also involved. Brain areas like the cerebellum, the medial frontal cortex, and the precuneus helped create a mental workplace to create imagined people, places, and things. So people with aphantasia who have trouble imagining things in this way, they may have had it their entire lives, or it may have been brought on by a, a disease or a trauma of some kind. Now, another theory about what might be causing aphantasia has to do with what's called cortical excitability. In other words, it's, it's, it's about how sensitive your neurons are in the prefrontal cortex. In a study published in eLife in 2020, researchers found that there's a negative correlation between cortical excitability and the vividness of the mind's eye. In other words, the less excitable a visual cortex is, the more vivid the mind's eye. Lead researcher Rebecca Keo told Fantasia Network, quote, When we found the cortical excitability was negatively correlated with imagery strength, we were at first surprised. But as all the other experiments started to line up showing the same trend, we became excited that we'd found a potential underlying mechanism that explains individual difference in imagery ability. The researchers conducted further studies and arrived at a theory that those who have hyperphantasia either have a not excitable visual cortex, an excitable prefrontal cortex, or both. And those with aphantasia may have a more excitable visual cortex, a less excitable prefrontal cortex, or both. And as I said before, this experience varies across individuals. It's not just one or the other. It's, it's a whole spectrum. And for me, this is just further proof that how we see the world is unique in, in so many different ways. I mean, we're literally talking about how we visualize things differently. And maybe now that we understand the Fantasia spectrum, we can kind of start a conversation about how we do see the world differently. You know, maybe this is the beginning of a new era of understanding where we celebrate our differences instead of dividing ourselves up because of them. Any day now. Any day now, it, it, could, it could happen. But since we're talking about interesting brain stuff, now might be a good time to talk about our fabulous new sponsor, Fabulous. I mean, they are fabulous, but they're also fabulous, you know, one with a small F and one with a, okay, I'm in an Abbott and Costello routine now. Fabulous is an app that helps you build and maintain healthy habits, and it's more than just a habit tracking app, which it does do that, but it also guides and motivates you through proven behavioral science. For example, it focuses in the beginning on simple, easy habits like drinking a glass of water in the morning because studies have shown that if you can start small and focus on tiny wins, that sets the stage for bigger changes later on. And it's 100% personalized to you and your needs. If you want to be self-guided, you can do that. And if you want to be more involved with habit coaching, you can do that too. Yeah, I've been trying to work on creating a daily habit of just doing stretches in the morning when I first get out of bed because your boy's getting tighter every year. I found that just five minutes of doing some yoga poses first thing in the morning leaves me standing straighter, getting around easier with less stiffness and pain, and I make the uh sound a lot less than I used to. Ugh. So whether you're working on physical health or mindfulness or just setting aside some time to read every day, uh, Fabulous has a variety of different ways to help you to sort of gamify your habit tracking and get you closer to your goals. And you know, you might not even need everything that the app offers. For example, they've got a social component where you can reach out for help and people can give you advice and motivation and whatnot. That's not really my thing, but if it's your thing, then it's there for you and there's multiple other ways to help you out as well. But if you want to give Fabulous a try and see what it's all about, the first 100 people to sign up at thefab.co slash Scott can get 25% off a premium subscription that gives you access to all the bells and whistles to get you to your goals faster. You know, we've been hearing a lot about the importance of mental health lately, which is a good thing. It's good that we're having that conversation in society a lot more these days. I have not been shy about the fact that I have dealt with anxiety issues my whole life, but I've found that creating solid habits through apps like Fabulous, uh, it's a good way to sort of 
create a center and then be able to sort of move on from there. So it's, it's important stuff. And like I said, if you sign up at the link below, you can get 25% off. So it's worth a shot. So go check it out. Big thanks to Fabulous for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are forming an awesome community, helping to support the channel, keeping the lights on around here and just being generally awesome people. Uh, I got some new names to shout out real quick. We got Samuel Voss. You've signed up before. Gunlocker Goodmanson. You did it twice just to make me read your name twice. Uh, Jackson Rutledge, Michael P, Roger Dodden. Welcome back, Do Roger. Um, Isidaro Acosta, Rick Thor, C. Brew, Jim Hayes, Marisa Marcenaro, Jeffrey Fielding, Gavin Wankham, and uh, Holden Mize. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them and get early access to videos and access to exclusive live streams and other good, goody, 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 good stuff, watch me fumble words, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, there's a video right here that Google and the YouTube algorithm thinks is right up your alley. So feel free to check that out or any of the others down there that have my face on them on the thumbnails. And if you enjoy them, and I hope you do, and you want to subscribe, uh, please do subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye opening rest of the week, stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.